I work anywhere I want. It's a beautiful thing is that everywhere is is an office for me as long as I've got a guitar around or so is it I a good can thing live anywhere. It's hard to turn it off. Exactly. Yeah. I'm I'm not bad at turning it on and off. I I wrote for the uh Nashville music industry for about 10 12 years. So mm-hmm. I learned how to turn it on and turn it off for appointments. I'd have a 9 to 5 co-write. And so you had to call the muse right there on the spot. And then I'd drive home from Nashville back to the Shoals, and I'd be dad and husband and homeowner. And so they didn't want to hear, you know, they, and which was great because they, uh, my wife lives in the other side of the brain and uh, she loves music, but that world, she's been there, heard it. And so I can turn it off yep. and that's good for me. It's I'm, I'm kind of schizophrenic in that way. So when it's time to write a record, I can turn on. And when I need to focus on touring or something else, I can I can turn that thing off in my head. She knew she was getting herself into a little bit when she married you. She did. You know, I feel a little bit like it might be a little bit of a cop out to say that, though, because when she met me, I was playing in a, a crappy bar okay. in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee. And so you were a long shot. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I was driving this horrible four-door Geo Metro, and the only car I read in Consumer Reports, the only car that was more dangerous than it was the two-door version of my car. And so, yeah, she didn't see dollar signs when she saw me walking across that stage. She just loved me for who I was, bless her heart, and I don't think she knew what she was getting into. I don't think any of us do. When we sing into our hairbrush and our shower or into the mirror we all want to sing for a living we all want to do this for a living but we don't really think we're going to and we surely don't know all the stuff that comes with it all the you know the underside of it all and all the technical and logistical and and all that all the communication you have to do and everything other than being on stage or creating a song that you have to do you know, nobody sells you that 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 romantic part of the music business. And so, and then when, you know, when people complain about it later, they're like, you asked for this. You wanted to be a singer. It's true. We have the best job in the world. So it's far be it for me to complain, but there's, there's times when it's my job. When did it really become a job for you? Not from the standpoint of, you know, the the, the shitty parts, but as far as actually going pro. I signed a, a publishing deal while I was in college with EMI up in Nashville. And I had no idea what I was doing as a songwriter. And the, and and I've said this before. I don't mind them knowing it. The only reason I signed it is because I wanted in. You know, I just wanted to be a singer. Were you like, this is it? Yeah. I'm there. It, yeah. It's done. Oh, it's yeah. Signed and sealed. Yeah, they've come in and they've dubbed me. You are now a hit songwriter. <laughs> you know, because I have this piece of paper, and I figured out really quick that I had no idea what I was doing. And it took me two or three years before I ever, you know, got a cut on someone's record. And I went through all the phases of, okay, I got to be myself. Okay, I need to be more country. Okay, I need to write something that sounds like what's on the radio right now. Okay, I don't need to do that. It was just constant second guessing and self hating and self loathing. And it was a job. And so my intent was to go back to college, get a second major. I'd already graduated, get a second major in computer programming, which I was close to anyway. And give it up because writing songs in that fashion was it was a job and it was a horrible job i mean i I would have rather mounted tires honestly it was that bad and so i started recording songs just for me with no intention of anybody else ever hearing it using their budget making these elaborate demos that i thought i'd just put in my pocket and say show my kids one day like hey I, i did that for a while and it was cool i chased it and it didn't work out but as soon as I started recording that stuff, people started cutting it. And then the EMI family started it started spreading around to New York and to LA. And I ended up getting a record deal with Capitol Records because of those demos. Are you glad that you saw the really shitty grind side yes. things early on? Hundred percent. Yeah. Oh, it was it was a great education for me. And one that had I known it was in front of me. I don't know if I'd have done it again. I don't know if I, I'm glad I didn't know. Yeah. But everything with me was the hard way. Everything <laughs> took longer than it seemed to take everybody else. I was I was stubborn about a lot of things that I'm proud I was stubborn about. But, yeah, everything seemed to take me about twice as long as most of the people that I 
revered and it always frustrated me and and I finally got to a place where I just stopped caring mm. about anybody else's trajectory, what I'm supposed to do or what I'm not and what age I should be when I figure things out, whatever that means. Uh I I just got to a really not desperate place, but I just got I got to a really good place you where let go. I let go. Yeah, and I I had nothing that was keeping me from it cuz I wasn't making a lot of money. It wasn't like I needed to keep chasing that price ring because it was nowhere in reach. So it wasn't that hard to let go at some point. I'd exhausted all options and said, all right, the only other option here is for me to just make music that pleases me and hope that there are other people out there like me that will be into the same things I am. And immediately things started clicking and that's happening. that's the rub right is we yeah. try to mold ourselves completely and follow somebody else's career yeah we do and we're constantly told be yourself and it sounds like a cliche but you got to get really you got to, you got to really cull away a lot of stuff to actually do it and i, I can't give that advice to students sure like, and it's first. like and it's like maybe i don't like myself that much you know I, we we all hate ourselves <laughs> why would i, I want to be myself when i could yeah, be bob dillett right? exactly i'd rather be anybody yeah. but me and you get past that too it's not ego it's not it's not arrogance it's just the only thing i know is what's going on in my head and what what gives me chill bumps when i read it on a page if i'm reading someone else's work or i'm watching a movie and all those things get cataloged into my head you know well what is it about that that makes your hair stand up and what is it about that that makes you hate it and wish you'd never heard it all those things just by osmosis they all kind of start getting filed into place and so the longer you write the less you even have to think about it you know there's just certain things you know you know where to go and you know where yeah. not to go and i i think that's what wisdom is is learning what not to do, what what doesn't make you happy. I mean, I think part of the trap we get into too, and this is, I think, probably more the case with popular music than it is anything else, is we tend to think of people doing their best work in their 20s, and, you know? I know. Tend to think of careers just sort of going downhill from there. It's, it's really frustrating, and we're sold that left yeah. and right. Um, but that's fine. I get it. You know, I was incredibly creative in my 20s. There was so much going on in my head that if I'd just known how to harness it, that could have been a very productive era. And you have the energy to do it. You have the energy yeah. to go work that job yes. during the day and go home and yes. pursue it. And to work through the night yeah. and, and body snap back and your mm -hmm. brain snap back and all that. I totally get that. And I'm I'm in awe of folks like John Prine, uh, mm. people like that that figure it out early, but they sound like they're in their 50s when they're in their 20s. And we're but, still doing it now. Though. And we're I mean, still doing it and still crushing it on, yeah. and still enjoying mm -hmm. doing it. I, I wrote for this new record with Whisper and Bill Anderson. Yeah. And I've never been in the room with somebody with more energy and more excitement about writing a song. I mean, he was downright giddy that we were writing a song. And I started playing uh, in 3-4 and... I'll never forget it. And he's just like, oh, we're going to ride a waltz. <laughs> I haven't ridden a waltz in so long. And I was like, God, please let me be. Yeah. Let me have that kind of childlike enthusiasm about creating when I'm that age. Because, you know, there's days when I want to just go run screaming for the hills. And it's good for me to be around folks like that, that help shine a light on how enjoyable and mm. how what what good work it is. You know, how lucky you are. How lucky I am. I remind myself of that every day because especially now, it's so survival of the fittest for music songwriters. I've got lots of friends that are pounding the pavement looking for jobs that are incredible, but they're not artists. Mm. They're just writers. And that world is just dwindling to nothing. This is what kills me every time I go to South by Southwest. In some ways, it's great to be able to experience all of those musicians at the same time. But I remember the first time I went and I was walking down that main drag and I walked past this sort of open front bar restaurant and there are about four stories and there are bands playing on each mm -hmm. one and it's really disheartening. It is. It makes you feel like a number. I think that's why I stay in Alabama. I'm just two hours from Nashville so it's easy for me to get into the race if I need to. But I feel, I feel more unique. I don't mm -hmm. feel like just one of another group and that's good for me that's good for my psyche but it's also good for me perceptually you know from people on the outside looking in they're like oh you're from nashville okay cool oh you're from muscle shoals alabama ah 
the Tell people who know that. know. Yeah. yeah, and in the music circles they do, and then when the documentary came out, that mm. helped as well. But I'm proud of that. But I'm I like being an outsider. I like, and nowadays you don't need to be in yeah. the middle of it all with you know with the internet. There's really less and less reason to. I get that thing every time I travel around where I kind of fantasize about. I mean, New York is. I'm not from here originally. I've been here for a while now, and mm. and I don't know anyone who lives here who doesn't have that sort of love hate relationship. Yeah, I travel around and I wonder what my life would be like in those yeah. places. I mean, did 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 you consider at any point moving away? I mean, it might have been earlier in your career easier to early make a on, go of it. Early on, I um I, I went up. My brother moved to Nashville. He was uh, and he needed a roommate, and I had always thought about it. I said, you know what? I'm going to do it. And I transferred my job up uh, to Nashville, and I figured out really quickly I couldn't afford it. And I was working two and three jobs and couldn't write any songs, couldn't meet anybody. I was making less headway in my career by moving there than going back home. So I was only there for about three or four months, and that was it. I'd, I'd never – you and I probably have a different thing going where – I travel all the time, and so my wanderlust is gone. I'm I'm always getting to see new places and eat new foods and stuff. So when I got go home, the simple thing is good for me. It's good for my soul to just let it all fall away and be able to walk around town and everything being half a minute from my house where I live. If if I mostly worked in a specific spot, it'd be a uh, It'd be tough staying there because there's just not a lot to do. Obviously, after the band dissolved, you, mm. you went home for a while, yeah. you know, spent time with the family. Mm. Did you start getting a little bit antsy after a while? No. No? no. <laughs> you didn't miss the road at all? I didn't. But, I, you know, I'd done it for a long time yeah. and, and I accomplished things I didn't dream of sure. doing. So, I mean, like when we played the Ryman, when we sold out the Ryman, I had a major, like, funk afterwards because that was always the the pinnacle for yeah. me it's all downhill from here huh? it felt <laughs> like it was just like okay now what yeah. and well we can play bigger rooms and we can play the ramen twice or whatever and, i, I and should just like, interject oh. for context that you played carnegie hall last night yeah yeah i didn't even dream of that yeah and but i had never had i'd never been in that room before and i swore i'd never walk in it until i was singing and and you did it. I did it. And it was everything I dreamed it would be. It's one of those places like the Ryman that it's hallowed ground, obviously. Everyone knows yeah. Carnegie Hall. Everybody knows the Ryman, at least that do what we do for a living. But even if you don't, Carnegie Hall is one that yeah. people know around the world. So I was looking around backstage and I thought, it's just a room. It's a beautiful room. But it's just a room. The people in it are what's made it special. Mm. But there's something about the acoustics in there that yeah. just changes your brain patterns. And there's pictures on the wall of like Mark Twain and Booker T. Washington and Langston Hughes. That's so much more interesting to me than yeah. musicians yeah. because that's my world. But seeing Mark Twain sitting on the stage I was getting ready to walk out on freaked me out. To, to that's the point where it's level. like I, I forgot that these – People were people. <laughs> yeah, they're not people. Yeah, the, they're, these were human beings that gods. walked the earth. These are gods. They, there was never a time before them in my head. You know, so it was a good thing. And I was surrounded by a lot of, of friends uh, just by coincidence. Yeah. It was um, about 20 artists doing the songs of Van Morrison. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot of Alabama folks there, the Secret Sisters and Anderson East and some of the band members of other guys in the you know, Blind Boys of Alabama were there. And that did my heart good. Yeah. You know? And it was the first time for most of us. So it was a good time. There's a crazy thing about music, right? This Irish guy yeah, on stage and yeah. playing his songs in New York. And there's something that brought all these Alabama people out. That's the beautiful thing about doing what we do for a living is you can touch people across the world, especially now, even more so now with the internet and with people, you know, being able to access everything at their fingertips with a click. You know, I, I see that as a good thing. And so, yeah, that people could, can listen to my music in India or mm. Australia or South Africa or whatever. He didn't have that. And still the, it, the tendrils of it reached all over the place. And so it's a, we all aspire to having a night at Carnegie Hall where everybody's singing our songs. If it wasn't Wanderlust, mm. if you didn't get antsy, what got you back out? 
this songs pop, um, uh, beating their up. way out yeah. of my head. I, I didn't want, uh, to ride them because, and I've said this before, I didn't want to walk across the street to play a note, much less go on tour. I didn't sing in the shower. I mean, I was so crispy that, and I was, it was kind of blissful because that stuff is always on loop in your head. Yeah. You know, there's always song ideas. You're talking and, about not being able to shut it off before. Yeah, right. And that is kind of, there's like a dull hum of that always going on. Even if you are good at shutting it off, shut, that's what you're really doing when you shut it off. You're letting it exist outside of your, you know, outside of your peripheral. Yeah. You know it's there, yeah. but I'm good at focusing away from you it. You can compartmentalize it. But it's say. always there. Yeah. And it wasn't there. And I could finally really focus on other things like what my wife was telling me about her day at work or my kids were telling me about their day at school or some friend was telling me about issues he was having with, you know, like his health issues with his mom or whatever. I could 100% focus on what they were talking about. You couldn't do that of, while you were being no, a musician? No. No. I can't now. I'm really? back. Yeah, it's it's. I feel like it's just a constant state of distraction. It's always something pulling, something needing to be done. Whether it be you need to communicate with somebody about something that you need to do, or is my ch- luggage packed? Do I need strings? Or there's a song that's popping up in the back of your head that that wants you to pay attention to it. And I've got four kids mm-hmm. in the house, and now a label and a studio, and and so it's just. Isn't it? But at that moment, none of that existed, and it was fantastic. You realize that you're describing a lot of people's nightmare, right? The tyranny of the blank page. Man, I guess that's probably true. You hear the story about Keith Richards waking up in the morning, and he has the recording of Satisfaction, and you spend your entire career banging your head against the wall. The idea that that might just shut off terrifies people when i hear those stories about songs coming fully formed in their head at the in the middle of the night that kind of thing i always thought bullshit apparently that's that's where astro weeks apparently he was sitting on a porch somewhere yeah. and just got all the songs for i always thought that yeah. was that was we're over romanticizing what we do and because i was a professional writer for so long yeah. I, I knew the craft and i knew how to turn it on and turn it off as i said so once everything went blank and I wasn't looking for anything. I was actually looking away. Things started coming back, and the record I put out, Beulah, came pretty fully formed and just fell out. And it was like a faucet was running, and I was catching it as fast as I could. And all that stuff made sense to me then. These people that have these epiphanies and songs just come out fully formed, and they don't understand where they came from. It was the first time that had ever happened to me. And it was because I think that I, I think I did that Coltrane thing where he talks about, you know, learn everything and then forget it all. And I think I just kind of explored every avenue and then just wiped it clean Mm -hmm. and started from zero. And things came from different angles than they had before. I didn't have preconceived notions of how to write a song. They just were writing themselves. And I was just like a conduit. And I hate talking like that. I seriously do. I It bores me. It always bored me when yeah. people talk like that because I think because it didn't work that way for me. And so I was just like, ah, oh, you're, you're lying. You're making this look more cool than it is. But now I get it. It doesn't mean I'm necessarily a better songwriter, but it feels better. It feels more organic. It feels like it's more I don't know. There's something predetermined about the songs that it feels really good to just be that vessel where they and and be good about just capturing them as they come out instead of thinking too much. You don't know if they're better than what you'd written before, but do yeah. they do they feel different? Do they sound yeah. different to you? They they resonate a little more. They're a little more personal than I allowed them to be in the past because I always felt like if if I wrote songs that only pertain to me that just was boring i wanted to write songs and i continue to write songs that are vague enough that you can see yourselves in that you can be the character in the song i had a a mentor back in alabama his name was walt aldridge he's a he's a he was a father figure for me and he used to tell me he told me a million things that i still use every day but he said don't put a wedding ring in a song And what he was getting at is that the second you put a ring in the song, you've just alienated 
everyone that's not in a relationship. Mm. They can no longer be that person in the song because now they're in a relationship. And he said that if it's got to be that way, then let it be. But more often than not, you don't have to have that item there. And you've just included everyone mm. by leaving out that one word. And I use that all the time. And so when people come to shows and talk to me after a show and say, hey, this song, I know what it means. And they'll tell me. Or, you know what this song was for me? It was my relationship with my dad or whatever. And very seldom is it what was really kind of going on in my head. And I just love that. The song is so much more powerful for it. It's, it's got so many lives, so many interpretations, that that's so much better than something super literal that pertained to a, something that happened in my life. Mm. I just, I don't think I'm interesting enough to for that to stay interesting to anyone else. Beulah wasn't that. Uh, Beulah was, I don't know what Beulah was. <laughs> Beulah, but Beulah was also vague as well. It was not specific. It was not autobiographical at all. So what does personal mean then? I think it's me getting out of my own way and not overthinking things. There, was, there, were, there were lines in Beulah that I tried to mark out because I was afraid people would read something into him as to, oh, I know what he's talking about now. This is about the breakup of the band, or this is not. We have family that you do want to protect and keep fairly private. I do, but I also don't think so much of myself that I need to shove my baggage on other people either. I don't think that's my job as a songwriter. I think my job is to inspire, hopefully, to help people relate to the things going on in their life, to give someone the feeling that they're not alone in feeling the things they are, maybe a path to from A to B, but because that's what people like Elliot Smith uh, and Towns Van Zant were yeah. for me is like, these people feel like their brain works the same way as I do. And they get you right, right at the right moment. Yeah. And I want to be that yeah. for people. So, but there were times in those songs where I was like, okay, that's just, that feels too on the nose. And I'd mark it out and try to write something else and just wouldn't work. Nothing else would work as well as that rhyme and that line and that phrasing and that. And so I just stopped getting in the way of it. And then it felt so much more personal, even though it wasn't autobiographical. Is Beulah an anomaly or is that? Yeah, I think so. Doesn't feel like the standard going forward for you? I don't think so. I try to keep my brain open to whatever comes, but this new record called The Hurtin' Kind was the first time I sat down and said, all right, who are you? What do you want to be? What do you want to say? Because with, I made it, the record for Capital was, was called The Long Goodbye. That record I made, I'd been a writer for 12 years, so I just found all of my best songs that fit into a package and cut them. And I'm really proud of that record. But That was, was the first solo. That was the first solo record. And then with the Civil Wars, everything is collaborative. So mm-hmm. it's 50-50 and there's push and pull and, and great things happen because of co-writes. I love collaborating. And it was really 50-50. Oh, it was, yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. And so with Beulah, it just fell out. There was no real conscious thinking about, do you want this to sound like the Civil Wars? Do you not want it to? Do you want it, uh, this too close? Is this too far? Will people like it? Will people not like it? That was not part of the equation. It just, here's the song. I feel this song. It's going to be on the record. And it's all just because you you really, you you backed away from it because in in a way, I mean, you probably should have felt more external pressure at that point in your career than any other point. I felt zero. I didn't give a shit. More so than the second Civil Wars record because it was like, oh, well, I just, I just, this is his expression. What does he sound like? Yeah. I just, I just didn't care what anybody thought. Yeah. I'm a hundred percent. And it was, it was not a conscious thing. It was just when I started writing the songs, it was a strange, strange feeling because it it was twofold. It was kind of, it was, it was, it was kind of schizophrenic in that I didn't care what anybody thought about my songs. And I didn't use that as criteria for writing the songs because, you know, like I said, there were lines that I had a moment of worrying about, will this lead people to think something that I don't want it to. And then I thought, screw it. This is what's supposed to be in the song. But then, as soon as I wrote these songs, the first thing that happened was, I want to play them for people. I want to see in their eyes if they connect with this thing. And I had not felt that before. I sang because I love to sing. I love to entertain people. But then I didn't want that anymore. 
and these songs showed me a different reason that I wanted to be out in front of people that I hadn't really fully been cognizant of, which was I wanted to watch a connection happen and see these songs change people and see their brains working as they're listening and hear their interpretations and for me to connect with them just like they were connecting with me. I'd never really craved that before. Does the entertaining feel more superficial then? It did, yeah. Superficial is probably not the right word, but it felt like there was craft to yeah. it. I knew the angles and yeah. the moves and yeah. the mic techniques and everything and how I should look and how I shouldn't look and how I should lay out the stage. All those things that I learned over time, which are very valuable and very useful. But it was the first time that a lot of that stuff fell away and it was really just about how people connected with the song and less with all that stuff. And... That was really, really good for me. The new record is also different from the standpoint that, mm. yeah, I mean, it sounds like it was planned. You were, yes. you're like, I'm going to go out and I'm going to yes. do another record. Yeah. So you sat down, you didn't have a bunch of songs piled up at that point. No, I didn't. And it was the first time, I've, I've been doing this a long time, and it's the first time I sat down and could just write whatever the hell I wanted to. Mm. And I looked at a page and said, who are you? Who do you want to be? What is the distillation of all the things that you've loved over your life to this point now? So let's break this down. Hmm. Who are you? I hope that I'm answering that for the rest of my life. Yeah. But I am Who a guy. Who were you when you when put I wrote this when I put this together? I was I was my dad's son who grew up with country music being shoved into his brain, whether he liked it or not, like Bob Wills and, uh, but like crooner country, you know, mm. Jim Reeves, Jim, uh, um, Eddie Arnold, yeah. uh, but Patsy Cline and, yeah, yeah. and, and Dolly and yeah. stuff like that. So, uh, singers, singers, yeah. Roy Orbison. And my mom listened to lots of show tunes and Broadway and, and like, and Dean Martin and mm -hmm. Johnny Mathis and people like that. Singers, singers. And entertainers. So that, entertainers, yeah, exactly. Some, a lot of them just interpreters of song. Mm -hmm. You know, people like Dolly, obviously she wrote her stuff, but Jim Reeves typically was just yeah. interpreting other people's work. And, and so I knew I wanted to do that because I was craving it so much from modern music. I was trying to find somebody that was doing that thing, especially a male, because there are females out there doing it well. Yeah. And I, I love, um, but no guys with the, you know, with the rose between their teeth standing mm. and, and putting their heart on their sleeve and singing and not being afraid for, of the big note, uh, afraid of the drama. And I was at just the perfect intersection of my life that I was ready to do that. And step forward and be counted and, you know, hear me roar. And, and so I did. And so I sought out the guys that wrote songs from that era, like Bill Anderson and Bobby Braddock, mm. who wrote a bunch of George Jones brilliance, like Golden Ring and Dia and He Stopped Loving Her Today and things like that. So I wanted to go after standards. I wanted to write as timeless as possible. I did it. And I'm incredibly proud of this record and I'm really excited about the future because I feel like I'm scratching the surface of something. I'm still, I hope I'm always feeling that, but I feel like I'm still figuring out who I am, how to write a song, how to sing, how to play guitar. I still feel like every day I'm, I'm learning so much and it's fun. It's a lot of fun. So when we get to this part two, who you want to be, mm -hmm. Who I want to be. Do you feel yeah. like this is your yeah. trajectory? I think so. Going forward. Yeah. I think yeah. it's just further distillation of that. Yeah. Um, and still, you know, I still like sad songs. I still, I always will. That's just what moves me. Those songs move me way more than happy ones do. Moments in my life that I mark time by are the sad ones typically or the tragic ones, you know, like, oh, that was right after my divorce. Oh, that was before so-and-so had his wreck. Those kinds of things. Not happy moments. Not, hey, man, that's that's right after Tennessee beat yeah. Alabama. <laughs> that's not how I mark time, as great as a moment yeah. that would be. And so that, that, those are the songs that yeah. always gravitated toward. And so that's, that's kind of always going to be my bread and butter. Part of the reason why people tend to shy away from earnestness, hmm. one, there's the kind of a worry about cliche. Yeah. But at the same time, maybe a lot of people don't feel like they've earned it. Yeah. Maybe you don't feel like early in your career, like you've you've lived your life and you're able to sing fair. those songs. I think that's fair. I always had this little aversion to 
quote unquote showing off, you know, doing a vocal run or a big note or mm -hmm. something, be like, who the hell does he think he is yeah. kind of thing. And now I feel really good in my skin and feel like you don't have to be impressed. I just, I like singing that big note. I like standing forward and singing those songs and making the focus the vocal and the song and everything else is just, you know, beautifying the edges of it. I, I'm a fan of that and I always have been and, and why not? I've read you talk about this a little bit and I don't know if you actually use the phrase imposter syndrome, but you've... Oh. You've kind of alluded to it to some degree. I mean, is that something, once you get to point, you you win a couple of Grammys, you get to mm. work with your heroes, you play Carnegie Hall, is it a thing that ever fully goes away? No, no, not at all. As a matter of fact, winning Grammys may have just like put it on stun because yeah. I remember a buddy of mine from high school, he texted me after after we won the two the first time around and he said, well, congratulations, you've done something that Queen and Led Zeppelin never did. And I knew what he meant. It's like, take this with a grain of salt, dude. Yeah, or maybe um, maybe it's not cool. And well, way. it was cool to me. Yeah. I mean, I We're I not grew like up Led Zeppelin cool. Right? Not Led Zeppelin. <laughs> I will never be Led Zeppelin cool. I'll never be Roy Orbison yeah. cool. I don't aspire to be. I'm just, I'm really learning to try to just be the best version of me mm -hmm. I possibly can, and figure out how all these paths intersect from my whole from childhood forward through through the civil wars through my years of being a songwriter in Nashville to being a dad to being a husband um to being a small town guy all these things I'm and I think I'll forevermore be trying to figure out yeah. that perfect point where it all intersects and hey, I kind of hope I never get there I mean I think there's two major hangups from imposter syndrome one of them is it can just cause you to give up before you try yeah. anything you know right. or or reach out to other people to collaborate and the other part is you just you get up in your own head way too much you second yeah. guess everything yeah and it sounds like to at least some degree you've overcome both of those maybe yeah. uh if i don't think about it too much um i think the imposter thing can really be on stun if you think you've figured something out and i don't I think I'm getting there. I think I'm pointing toward it. I think you keep figuring the same thing out over and over again. That, I mean, over the course of this fair. conversation, the idea of um, other people's expectations and getting out of your own head, you've, mm -hmm. you've learned that at two very distinct points. Yeah. 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 When it comes, though, to, again, working with a, a legendary musician or a, I guess especially a songwriter, how do you silence that and sit down and just enjoy mm -hmm. the process? Because of the exuberance of those songwriters. If I walked into a room with a songwriter that I felt I was being judged, yeah. that'd be tough because I will never feel like I measure up to my heroes. But I walked in and they immediately made me feel like an equal. Mm. They were so interested in my past and in my work and they were they were they talked about songs of mine and which made me really feel like in no way were we equals, but they considered it that way. They looked at me as like you're younger and you haven't been doing this the same amount of time as us, but we love what you do and we want to feed off of that. And so that was very helpful for me. And to write those songs and feel comfortable and for them at the end of the process say, hell yeah, this is a great song. I love this song. Thanks for writing it with me. Then I feel like that's all the validation I need to continue doing this. If I can get a stamp of approval from those guys that I'm on the path and that I'm not contriving something and I'm not being just a, a retro act. Mm. Uh, it's the last thing I want to do. Those guys did a thing that I could never yeah. improve on. I'm doing my own thing, but it is informed by those great records. At the beginning, you were trying to, for EMI, write a hit song. And now for this record, not a hit song, but I guess timeless is maybe the word you would use. Yeah, uh, would, Are those two really different things? I think in certain eras, they weren't different yeah. things. I think now, yeah, maybe so. Mm. I, I, But who knows what a hit even really means anymore. Sure. I think for me, a hit is a song that people continuously ask me to play mm. at a show. People, or the song I sing and I see people mouthing the words. That's a hit. That is a hit for me. Because who knows how long radio exists? Who knows how long anything exists? But the thing that will always will be us traveling minstrels, standing on stages and playing our songs for our supper. That'll never go away. Is the process of writing a song with one of those guys or writing a song with Taylor Swift, are those are mm. those that 
vastly different? No, they're not different at all. Yeah. Because she, and, and I don't know how she attacks writing a song that she knows she's going for radio. But in that situation, we all knew we were writing a song for The Hunger Games. And we were all, we'd all read the books before the movie first movie came out. And so that was really 100% a situation where all four of us, T-Bone Burnett was involved too, where we um, just immersed ourselves in it and said, we need to write something that's relevant to this movie, not something that we think radio would play. And an hour later, the song was done. It was a beautiful thing. I mean, she's a fantastic songwriter. She's a very intelligent person, very driven. I don't know anybody as driven and competitive yeah. as her. And it was a, it was a blast. And I learned things. I and mean, she, she's a, she's a bird dog. I mean, she goes after it. And once she's into the songwriting process, she's focused. Yeah, she's. Uh, I'm a fan. Are, are you having fun again? Yeah, I had. I was. I was having fun all along. You I got guess. burned out though, and you didn't want yeah. to go back. I no, mean, that's true. But yeah. I mean, I don't want people to get the impression that now I'm finally happy. <laughs> you know, it, it's all relative. But sure. I'm. Are you I'm happy? in a good. Pl- I'm very. Yeah. I am. I'm in a really good place. I feel like again, I'm getting closer to figuring me out and what I. You know, I'm happier each time I play a song and I'm ready to write some more songs, to be honest. I'm, I mean, I'm not going to. I'm going to focus on promo and touring and giving these songs all the, the encouragement that they deserve. But yeah, I'm, I'm ready to write some more. There you go. That was John Paul White. Hope you enjoyed that conversation half as much as I did. His new record, The Hurting Kind, is out this week on Single Lock Records. Thanks so much to him, and thanks to Joe Cohen at Sax Co. for helping set up that conversation. Thanks to you guys, as always, for listening to the program. If you like the show, there are a number of ways to support us. You can rate and review us on iTunes, Google Podcasts, or on Spotify, YouTube, anywhere where you happen to get your podcasts. Like us on Facebook. If you have any feedback, it's rwellcast at gmail.com. Follow us on Tumblr. That's riylcast.tumblr.com. That's the first and best place to go for RIYL related information. And that's about all we got for this week. So stick around because we are going to be back just about this time next week with another episode of RIYL.